I invite you to sit down to start the round table. New technologies, ethics, society. My name is Rosa Pedro. I'm a teacher of the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro. And I would like to call to compose this table Professor David Rosner from the from Columbia University, Professor João Riscado Nunes from the University of Coimbra, Portugal, Professor Gilson Luiz de Oliveira Nunes from GA Lima from the University Methodist uh, Center in southern Brazil. And Professor Adriano to coordinate this debate. I would like to present each of the in of the guests. Professor David Rosner, Professor History of History in the Art Faculty. of science and director of the History Center of Public Health in Colombia at School of <coughs> States, communities, they make communities <laughs> First of all, thank you very much. I really want to thank uh, uh, William Weisman for the wonderful invitation to speak to you today. Uh, I'm uh, really a, li a little bit overwhelmed by speaking to a scientific audience because actually I'm merely a historian. A historian has spent his uh, long career looking at uh, toxic materials and also the history of decisions about making uh, toxic materials widely available in the environment. Um, Rarely do I speak to scientists themselves, so this is really a wonderful opportunity, so thank you. Um, also, I really uh, appreciate being in this extraordinary, be extraordinarily beautiful city. Uh, this is really a special treat. Uh, today, I'm going to you know, really start by trying to give a cautionary tale, by trying in a very short period of time to summarize a crisis that has appeared in the United States and that has developed over a long period of time over the past century a crisis over an environmental pollutant whose problems and whose uh, dangers we have understand literally for centuries. Uh, the problem is lead poisoning and childhood lead poisoning in particular and uh, workers lead poisoning in particular as well. Uh, for those of you who know the brief history of lead, uh, all I'm going to briefly do is tell you that in the United States at least and I think probably throughout the world, uh, this is still one of the major environmental pollutants that have plagued us. Literally in the United States, hundreds of thousands of children are still diagnosed with elevated blood lead levels, which cause various kinds of neurological problems. Workers are exposed to low-level example of toxins that, as Ellen Silvergeld has pointed out in other pu publications, actually still now are identified as causing heart disease. We have had a host of problems with a toxin, with a material that was once hailed as a gift of God. It was hailed by those who were promoting its use and those who were speaking at conferences and those who were, uh, uh, who were developing a lobby, essentially, for the promotion of this well-known industrial toxin. Uh, it's interesting to be at a scientific meeting like this only because as I watch it develop over the last two, year, two days, I see that there are enormous similarities between the crises that um, were created in part by ourselves in the early part of the century and the crises that we may be able to foresee in the future. Uh, we often are enamored, uh, absolutely in love, uh, with the development of new technologies, new technologies that are just extraordinarily beautiful in their public format, uh, that uh, develop uh, images that are just breathtaking, and also develop a science that is absolutely astounding. It's science that just looks 
um, uh, amazing to the, uh, to the layman's eyes. Uh, some of those slides we saw yesterday uh, when, um, when we looked into the alveoli of, uh, of rat's lungs, I couldn't think of better art forms than, than that. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, the development of, a, of this crisis in the United States. And I'm going to start out, I think, uh, somewhat differently than most of the speakers have. And I hope you can put up with what, how a historian speaks and, um, and how I'm going to be presenting. I'm going to start out with actually a, let's see, how do I do this? A very personal experience I had a number of months, a number of years ago, three years ago, when I received an email from a Barb Manoverini from a group called the, the Roundtable Group. And the Roundtable Group, let's see, uh, was an organization created for essentially the uh, hiring of, of scholars to participate in major lawsuits and major kinds of activities. Uh, and here's the email I received. Uh, Dear Dr. Rosner, I'm writing to introduce you to the Roundtable Group and to notify you of a specific short-term consulting opportunity which may be of interest. Our attorney client is seeking an historian, highly credentialed, I guess that was me, okay, and at a prestigious university, I guess that's Columbia, uh, to perform some historical research and to instruct a lay jury on what was known about a particular occupational hazard, lead paint contamination, between 1950 and 1980. This was the line that really got my, uh, caught my interest. The historian need not be a subject matter expert. In other words, you didn't really have to know very much about your subject. Okay? Our client is mainly interested to find an historian who is also a good communicator, someone who can easily communicate a story to a lay jury. This was fascinating to me because they were looking for a historian of lead and lead toxicology, and they were actually asking me whether I would work with them to promote an image and a story that could be delivered to a lay jury. Interestingly enough, they were recruiting somebody, and they were recruiting, trying to recruit me to testify against me in a lawsuit that had been developing in the state of Rhode Island uh, at the very same time. Uh, this group was looking for a historian who could be presented to a jury of laymen, of lay people, right, and tell them a story that the industry, that their client actually wanted to hear. RTG is a consortium of several thousand professors and industry experts in management, law, medicine, science, computer science, education, engineering, economics, and other disciplines who make themselves available to provide customized expert witness and consulting services to law firms and companies who are clients of Roundtable Group. This was a huge operation. When I looked at their uh, website, they said that there were over 45,000 American, American scholars who were essentially part of this group and had been hired to perform tasks on behalf of industries to essentially tell a story to lay juries about specific histories of specific subjects. The lawsuit that they were trying to recruit me to, uh, to talk in was a, a lawsuit that occurred in the state of Rhode Island. Uh, state, the state of Rhode Island had been covered in lead paint for the previous past century. And during the course of the last century, literally tens and hundreds of thousands of children in Rhode Island had been poisoned by that paint because they had gotten dust, gotten chips, sucked on objects that were covered with paint that were covering the city primarily, one city of Providence, Rhode Island. Interestingly enough, they were looking for, the state of Rhode Island had decided that because lead was a known toxin for many, many years, based upon work I had done and work I had written about, that the, not only should the society, the state, should try to find ways of ameliorating the problem, but the industry itself should bear some responsibility for having spread a known industrial toxin on the walls of the entire state. And they were suing the industry for the costs, not just of the damage done to the hundreds of thousands of children in Rhode Island, 
but for the cost of preventing lead poisoning among thousands of children who would soon live in the very houses that were covered with lead. It's a very innovative case in which they were trying essentially to prevent future cases of lead poisoning by taking the lead off the wall and trying to get the industry to take that lead off the wall. I was interested in this letter because it said if you would be interested in being a candidate and serving as an expert witness, or are interested in learning more about the case, I'd be delighted to hear from you. Simply reply to this email with a one to two paragraph statement of your expertise for this project, a copy of your resume, and your current billing rate. I called them just to let you know what the billing rate was, that was acceptable to them was over $400 an hour, okay? This is the kind of importance that this case had. These are just a few of the uh, indications of the power of this case and the importance of this case and the unusual situation that a historian was in, a historian who essentially really prefers walk, working in libraries alone, never talking to anybody outside of the academic community, and never talking to anyone about anything important, uh, was subjected to. Uh, these are some of the headlines, lawyer, historian, spar over lead paint. I was on the stand for six and a half days of cross-examination. Uh, paint lawyers work to discredit historian. Lead paint historian testifies for third day. Every day in Rhode Island, there was a headline about the history of lead and the entire, and the entire community actually learned what lead was, how many children were poisoned, and the historical legacy of allowing this poison into the environment. At the end of, I'm sorry, at the end of the trial, <laughs> we'll get to that. Uh, <laughs> at the end of the end of the trial, the jury of laymen and the city of Providence and the state of Rhode Island had actually learned a great lesson about the history of lead and the importance of this case when they decided that the industry that had sold this lead, that had made this pigment, that had put it in a consumer product, had known about the dangers of lead for over almost a century and that they bore responsibility. And the responsibility was between two and four billion dollars for the state of Rhode Island to, to take the lead off the, off, off the, off the state, um, off the walls of the state. This was an extraordinary moment. In fact, for a lonely historian working out there in the vineyards doing innocuous histories, uh, it was probably the high point of my life uh, other than my marriage and my children's birth. Um, very quickly, about a year later, uh, two years later, the case was reversed and the Supreme Court said, we can't afford this, we can't hold industries responsible for the promotion of a deadly product, we can't hold industry responsible for deaths of children and the damage to children that will be done in the future, we can't hold industry responsible at all, and we're therefore going to reverse this case on the basis of a technicality that was brought to court under the wrong law, okay? This is 10 years of litigation was thrown out by the Supreme Court with this one statement. It was the wrong law. You shouldn't use nuisance law. You can't sue on behalf of children who aren't harmed. You can only sue on the basis of who has been harmed in the past. Therefore, you can't get money to remove lead from the environment. We couldn't find a way of actually taking this poison that's surrounding hundreds of thousands of children in the United States today, millions of children in the world today, children who are in, in the path of smelters, who are near mining communities, who are living in lead-painted homes, who are breathing in toxic materials from tetraethyleted gas. We can't find a way of getting, I don't know how uh, the translator will translate this, uh, but getting the toothpaste back in the bottle, or the tube. How are we going to take this poison, once it's distributed widely and allowed into the environment, and how are we going to recapture it once the damage is done? In some sense, listening to the conference today, that's an important message for all of us to hear. Uh, the second half of the book, and I'll just, just quickly go through this because I heard the laughter, um, was about another product, another industrial product, which had a similar history, which was vinyl chloride. How did the world become addicted to a plastic, right, that 60 years ago we barely knew anything about or had any contact with? How was it that we found, this is a Roy Lichtenstein 
um, uh, Roy Lichtenstein um, uh, art object uh, showing how did we get our food wrapped in this plastic? How did we get this whole world that once lived very nicely without it, how did we end up having it all around us? Um, for those of you who remember The Graduate, you'll remember that famous line, uh, famous line in The Graduate which said, what is our future? They take The Graduate to the side. What is the future? The future is plastics. Do you remember, anybody, the young people in this room won't remember, but everybody older will remember that line. Plastics, that was 1970 when this crisis was developing, when it was being pushed on us in all sorts of ways. Um, this was the problem that developed, which was that it was found that vinyl chloride produced angiosarcoma of the liver in a host of workers, and the part of the book that got people really upset, and that would, you'll see what happens, um, was the story of, um, of workers who identified as developing angiosarcoma of the liver from exposure to vinyl chloride monomer. Uh, this is simply what happened to us after a number, of, uh, a number of cases came to bear in which workers were suing for exposure to this deadly product uh, after discovering that through documents in our book, after discovering that, uh, uh, that there was information within the industry that indicated that there was danger to animals, rat animals, uh, that it was not communicated to the public, that was actually kept secret. Okay, uh, That was the gist of what we wrote in our one chapter of our book, and it ended up getting us uh, in a fair amount of trouble. The simple story is one, one other afternoon, I'm sitting at my computer, and I get a phone call from experts who had been uh, peer reviewers of my work. And they all, one after another, eight independent researchers, including the former head of the National Cancer Institute, called me to say that they had been met as late as 11.45 at night by lawyers serving subpoenas on them to appear in court with all documents and all materials related to their contact with me at any time in the past, with the University of California Press, with the Milbank Foundation, and even with the National Science Foundation. They were required to bring to court all these records because that also had been requested to provide every document, every email, every letter that constituted any contact with us. Uh, that was not uh, the only thing that happened. It was then found that, perhaps the roundtable group, but uh, 20 uh, law lawyers had actually hired a other historian to begin to attack our ethics and to essentially tell us that we, um, uh, to force us to back off of any attention to the history of knowledge about the dangers of vinyl chloride and lead. Um, I'm just going to skip over some of this. Um, a fair number of articles appeared about this issue, about how two historians uh, had been uh, subpoenaed and their work subpoenaed in an unprecedented move by attorneys for Dow, Monsanto, Goodrich, Goodyear, Union Carbide, and other major chemical companies. Uh, this itself was pretty intimidating for, a for, for this particular historian, intimidating. Uh, this was the book that had been produced and had caused all the trouble. And I'm going to now very quickly go through a little bit of the history of one part of that problem that specifically dealt with the issue of lead poisoning. And I'm going to bring you back to the early part of the century, the early part of the century when lead was first identified as a major important industrial hazard. Uh, and here I'm just going to, I'm showing you a little film from 1904, showing, uh, that's me on the top. You see me waving? Okay. Uh, because this is how I felt at the moment when I got these subpoenas from the court. Uh, this was me kind of coming down from a building in a world that had been radically transformed by the creation of major industries that had a major stake in the use of lead. Um, this is how, this is kind of a, a Bushian world, a perfect Republican world in which there's no regulation, there's no, uh, no attempt to control substances, and no protection for the workforce who's uh, in danger of being poisoned. Um, but I like this picture anyway, but it kind of symbolizes both 
my own anxiety at the moment when I was being subpoenaed, but it also symbolizes a world without regulation in which lead slowly became a major substance in this new industrial economy. One of the major mainstays of the new industrial environment was the creation of the American auto industry. And to very quickly summarize a very complex and interesting history, when lead was first introduced into gasoline, it was done so at the behest of the General Motors Corporation, who was in major competition with the Ford Motor Com Company, and who was trying to find a new additive to gasoline that would allow it to power Buicks and Chevrolets and Cadillacs that would overtake the market for the Model T Ford. Very quickly, public health officials and some public health workers identified a potential danger of introducing what they called loony gas, tetraethyl lead, a known industrial toxin, lead being a known industrial toxin, into the environment. And here's some headlines from the newspapers about the early worries about taking an industrial toxin that had been known to be poisoning workers and distributing it throughout the environment without any safeguard. The importance of this was essentially that this was the first substance that was hailed at the time as a gift of God by the industry and was hailed as a potential um, way of, of improving American life and American industry that ultimately was going to poison us all. Uh, this is uh, another headline. These are the anxieties that were provoked when various, very serious uh, public health scholars pointed out that auto exhaust of tetra lead could potentially be uh, a major, major hazard, but that by this point, billions of dollars, billions of dollars were involved in whether or not we would accept tetraethyl lead or actually ban it. In response to this, what's interesting here was that the response was to create a conference. In some sense, that resembled this, except because of Dr. Weissman's foresight, actually has in it protections that did not necessarily occur in the first tetraethyl lead conference. Uh, the conference was the first national conference about a toxic material in the United, in the United States history. It was about tetraethyl lead uh, called by the Surgeon General to address the problem of what it means to take a known industrial toxin and put it into the broad environment without any safeguard for the future. They brought together scholars from science, from industry, from government, and even from opposition groups to essentially develop a means of finding a way of protecting the environment from known hazards. The conference was ultimately the basis for a 60-year crisis. The crisis was that for the next 60 years after this conference occurred, there was no safeguard put on the use of lead in, tetra in, in gasoline. The conference brought together scholars who had very vibrant arguments, but ultimately were overwhelmed by the science and the scientists and the industries that had an enormous stake in the production of tetraethyl lead. The auto industry, the gasoline oil industry, and the chemical industries, all of which who had a tremendous interest in shaping the way we thought about this problem. One of the interesting aspects of the conference was simply that it created an unstoppable steam engine in which anyone who protested or thought about the potential danger in the long run from tetraethyl lead was put in the position of being anti-science, been put in the position of being a Luddite, being, the, uh, in being a retrograde who was trying to stop the progress of society. It was a very interesting process in which this conference ended up not just questioning the value of ethyl gas, the uses of gas and lead, but actually in justifying, legitimating it, and actually creating a group of experts who could control the way this material was understood and the dangers of this material 
a group of experts that had very close ties to the very industry they ostensibly were trying to regulate. It's very interesting to watch other examples of the same process occur throughout history, whether it be about PCBs, DDT, a whole series of known problems and hazards that, in which the conference, the conference actually pr proves to be, ends up in some sense suppressing dissent rather than in encouraging questioning. Uh, I don't think that this is the case here. This is very interesting because today certainly was not a, a moment in which dissent was, was questioned. But what's interesting is that the focus of the crisis that we face today where we have still huge amounts of environmental lead throughout the environment was in part produced by the creation of a constituency that of scientists, academics, universities, governments, and institutions, and, and uh, companies that had a definite role in defining who was and who was not an expert who had a right to speak and who did not have a right to speak, who had a right to, be a state, uh, to have a statement and who had no voice at all. The point being, I don't know whether this has to do with this current state of nanotechnology. I suspect that there are enormous interests involved in shaping the future of this field. Uh, the tetraethyl lead story, in this brief time I have, is, should be seen as in some sense, a cautionary tale, a tale in which we understand that even with the best of intentions and even with open discussion, there is always that danger that we are ourselves creating a constituency for the creation of our next environmental crisis, a creating a constituency in which we all have a stake in the very material that we're trying to understand and critique. I'm going to stop here because I know you're about to stop me, right? I, no, I have time? Five minutes. Five minutes, OK. Well, in that case, I'll always, historians, historians usually talk in um, usually uh, hour and 15 minute bursts. So I'm going to continue for an hour and 15 minutes. No, I won't do that. But let me uh, just uh, go for The power of this industry was enormous. Very quickly, you started seeing a promotion of lead, not as a potential hazard, but actually as a potential benefit to the society. First in the tetraethyl lead company industry, but then in, in the paint industry, in which lead was hailed not as the industrial toxin we had always known it to be, but as a safe, beneficial material that was going to promote the future progress of the society. These are just a few of the articles that began to appear in the 1920s about lead paint that was now being introduced into the booming cities of the Northeast and the Midwest and the United States, and that was already creating concern about, about the dangers. Here's an article by Kenneth Blackfan from, the from Johns Hopkins University, who first identified articles by Australian writers Gibson, Love, Turner, Brunel, and Young about the dangers of lead paint and who were then um, ultimately uh, integrating this into our understanding of the lead crisis for children in the United States. We had built a whole industry around the production of a pigment that was going to be the basis for a lead mining explosion at that time. This is how lead was being promoted. And this is how we began to learn about it. Not as a danger, not as an industrial toxin, but actually something that was going to protect us from disease. It, lead was in our entire life. Lead was in pipes centuries old. Lead, lead was in joining pipes. Lead was in paint. Lead was in gasoline. Here's lead paint here. Here's bars of lead. Here are all the substances that the, that the Dutch Boy lead, uh, National Lead Company was promoting through its Dutch Boy symbol. This is how it was being promoted in journals, as basically a safe toxin, a safe material that children could use. And this is what was being promoted and discussed within the companies themselves. Here are a few slides of some company documents that caused such a stir and got us into the trouble. These are from the, Nash, this is from the Lead Industries Association, and this is what they were talking about in 1929. 
Lead poisoning. Of late, we have received much underserved publicity in newspapers damaging to lead products. The U.S. Daily gave prominence to reports of babies and children allegedly being lead poisoned by chewing paint on cribs. The general problem, they said, was how to establish a good name for lead, how to promote it as a safe product, not a dangerous product, and to counteract such unfair and unfavorable, and the next line is publicity. The industry framed the problem of lead poisoning not as a public health issue, but as a public relations issue. How could we change the image of lead from being a danger into being actually seen in a positive light? And that's what would go into literally, literally decades of propaganda that would come from the industry. This is another article. In connection with this whole matter, the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company actually discovered scores and scores of children around the country who were being poisoned. This is in 1932, 1933. Scores of children, and they had written a report that the industry had protested. The industry had said, oh my God, how could you present, that's unfair to our product, as if the product had feelings, right? How could we stop this industry? How could we stop this negative publicity about our product? And they had actually gone to Metropolitan Life, which is the largest industrial insurer in the country, if not the world, at that time. And here's what the Metropolitan Life said. In connection with this whole matter, which is the publicity around leaded, get, leaded paint, please be advised that our bulletin article received a great deal of publicity against which there was strong remonstrance by the Lead Industries Association. They protested this. You will readily understand that we wish to avoid any controversy with the lead people. This was a lobbying group that was promoting lead, that was suing people, that was visiting physicians, that was counteracting every case of lead poisoning that was being identified. Please, therefore, they were writing to the U.S. Children's Bureau, do not mention the Metropolitan in any connection whatever releases you may make. The Children's Bureau of the U.S. government was asking for information and not even the Metropolitan Life Insurance Company was willing to stand up to this huge industry that had developed around this deadly toxin. I just want to show you this because this, is, this gives you a sense of how horrifying this, in, in, this product was and how this industry had reacted to publicity about this product. This is from an internal report about lead poisoning among workers and here, you'll see that they're discussing Dr. Alba, a very prominent Harvard physician, Harvard researcher who had been hired as a, con as a consultant for the company, was talking about liver extract as being repeatedly shown to be of little value in secondary anemia due to lead poisoning, but its use would do no harm. And here's what the le li liver extract was being promoted for. Preparing a case for workers' comp from a worker who had been poisoned seems to give a lot of worry about compensation, workers' compensation, a worker who had been poisoned, who was trying to get some compensation, and they were fighting it. This is the industry. If you are pretty free of lead, if you want to just prime him for the compensation court examination, in other words, get him ready for the examination so that he would not be discovered to have lead poisoning, if you'll inject him with liver, you will find it will bring him up, bring up his blood lead levels, or blood levels, so that you could not see uh, lead in his blood, but it doesn't do him any good. The bone marrow is pretty active, and you can shove in a little liver at the time, and you can make the blood cells pump out into the system for a few days. That will get you by the compensation board if you're interested in doing that. That's what they're talking in regard to workers who are being poisoned. How do you get him to get past the compensation board so he would not be identified as a uh, lead victim? Shall we proceed with the discussion of our first question, the value of industrial dental hygiene? Does anyone here uh, have to make any observations of the topic? You would think that this is about dentistry in, in industry, and here's what the answer, what industry could do. I think that dentistry and industry is very important, at least taking care of the pyrrhea and yanking out a bunch of the stumps, which most of them have, most of the lead poisoned workers have, 
enabled us to cut down on the lead line which the shyster lawyer will attack. Dental hygiene was even corrupted. You could pull out their teeth and they'd never have a lead line. This is going to be the last set of slides, I promise. I'm sorry for going over, but I'm going to show you the last set of slides because this was part of the propaganda effort to essentially tell us that lead was not a hazard, could be used safely in the environment, that could become a mainstay of our, of our children's world. These were little booklets that were produced, little paint books in which one side was a colored in picture and the other side was a, 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 a outline and children were given little paints to paint in this little stuff. I'll show you here. This is, this is what they look like. The stories were usually, these are scores of these little booklets were handed out uh, over the course of about 30 years. And basically the story went, uh, the story was how did lead protect children from the evils of the outside world? And here's one of them. The girl and boy felt very blue, their toys were old and shabby too. They couldn't play in such a place, the room was really a disgrace. All gray and old with nothing bright, which surely was a sorry sight, and yet poor neglected room was a delight of old man gloom. The point being is these kids were depressed because they had dark, dark wallpaper at the time. And they were going to try to get rid of old man Gloom, who's kind of this Victorian character, by brightening up the room. The mother comes in, who's a very modern mother. This is the 1920s, right? She has short sleeves. She has a little bun in her hair. She's wearing high heels. And she invites in the Dutch boy lead character, who is from National Lead. And he's showing her how to use showing the children how to use lead paint on their room to brighten up the day. The Dutch boy painter looked around and said, this is the worst I found. For feeling blue, you're not to blame. Come, let me show you a new game. This famous Dutch boy lead of mine can make your playroom fairly shine. Let's start our painting right away. You'll find the workers only play. And the rest of the book is, is a discussion of how you can mix your lead paint, right? You can set up your ladder. You can paint your room, you can paint your furniture, you can cover your entire world with lead. The entire world of ch children with lead. That old men gl gloom cried, it's a fact, I will have to change my act, my work is all undone, he said, by Dutch boy art and Dutch boy lead. We have a world that literally was covered with lead, where you could actually have the inside of your room, your toys, your cribs, covered with a deadly toxin. And that was the basis for the lawsuit in, in Rhode Island and the cr ongoing crisis of children throughout the United States and actually children throughout the world who have elevated blood lead levels today. And I'm just going to end with this one slide, which is a statement from the Lead Industries Association, which had protected and defended and promoted the use of lead for the last 30 years. Their program, circa 1958, of how they were going to promote lead in the future and how to defend it from attacks from naysayers who were accusing it of having poisoned the world. This is how they had to defend it. They had to say that lead ch childhood lead poisoning is essentially a problem of slum dwellings and relatively ignorant parents. That until we can find the means to get rid of our slums, which was perceived as being impossible, right, and educate the relatively ineducable parent, the problem will continue to plague us, and it still does today. So I'm going to stop here, because I can go on for next. And finally, if you know how to answer those two, you're more of a genius than I. The program of the Lead Industry, Pro, uh, Industry Association became promoting lead by essentially denying its harmful effects and also arguing that it was the very victims of lead poisoning who were actually the cause of the problem. The ineducable parent who stupidly allowed their child to crawl on the floors, to go over to radiators, to look out of windows, to, to touch their fingers to their mouth and end up ingesting all this toxin. It wasn't our fault as an industry, it was their fault as patients. So I'm going to stop here, and just with that picture of Herb Needleman, and that's a whole other story. Thank you very much.